your Bibles, let's look together to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. Foundational text is going to be coming from verse 25 through 27. And then we're going to fast forward over to the gospel of John, chapter 3. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Some of you have it, some of you are still looking. Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. If you're in Genesis, you've not gone far enough. All right. Starting with verse 25. May God bless the reading of His Word. The prophet says here, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. And then you will live in the land that I have given your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all uncleanness and I will summons the grain and make it plentiful and will bring famine, not bring famine on you. And I will also make the fruit of the trees and produce the field plentiful so that you will no longer experience reproach among the nations on the account of famine. And so let's turn over now to the Gospel of John and you're going to find some similarities. Many times when we get to the Gospel of John chapter 3 and we talk about Jesus going to speak to one of the leading Pharisees of his time, Nicodemus, our minds begin to shut down and we start thinking about what we want for lunch later in the day. We start thinking about all kinds of things, the sermons we've heard on John chapter 3 verse 16. But I want to let you know that if we read the Bible and we get bored with the Bible, then something's wrong because the Bible is so alive and so active that when we hear Scripture, even if you hear the same Scripture Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, that the Word of God is alive and it still should convict us and get us excited about what God is doing. And what I want to show you is that what many times pastors overlook because we don't connect the Old Testament to the New Testament and understand that God's Word is one big testimony of God. And so if you look at and you've marked your Bibles of Ezekiel chapter 36, what we just read, what I want to show to you and prove to you today is that when Jesus gave a testimony, when Jesus was talking about Himself, He used the Word. You see, the Word was in the beginning, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And Jesus says in the Bible that He is the Word. And so when we are trying to lead someone to Christ, when we're trying to tell someone about salvation, we should use the Word of God. And that's what we're going to see today is that Jesus Himself used the book of Ezekiel in talking to Nicodemus. How many of you knew that, that Jesus used Ezekiel? to actually witness to Nicodemus. Probably not many of us. Well, here we see in John chapter 3, a very familiar passage. It says, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform the signs that you do unless you were with him. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born again when he's old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? Nicodemus asked. Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Jesus replied to him, I assure you we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I had told you what things that had happened on earth and you did not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? 
No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him shall have, will have, everlasting eternal life. Now stop there for a moment. So what Jesus is doing is using the prophet Ezekiel to tell Nicodemus about the need to be born again. Now today, why I said I want this to be a teaching message is because what I have discovered in the years of ministry is that sometimes we get titles mixed up of what we put on people. One of the titles that we get mixed up sometimes and very often is we get the title of Christian and the title of saved mixed up. The Bible says not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Not everyone that says they're saved is actually saved. Not everyone that says, you know what, that, that's a good person there. Uh, that person, they've done a lot of good for the community. That person there, they've got a good heart. They must be saved. I'll let you know this, is that we're known by the fruit we bear. And if we're saved, we're going to be producing the fruit that Christ has inside of us. But oftentimes we look at someone and we're told, do not judge. And we think of that in a negative way. Don't judge them and say, oh, well, they're a hypocrite or they're this, that, and the other. But what we do oftentimes is we judge people and look at them and we put the title of saved on them and have no idea if they're actually saved. We've heard people over the years talk about someone that goes on to be with God and we talk about them as if they're already walking on the streets of gold, as if they're already having a conversation with Jesus and, and talking it, itself to Simon Peter in heaven. But we don't know if that person's saved. It's between them and God. But what we do know is what the Scripture tells us. When we look at the Gospel of John and think about the book of Ezekiel and Jesus talking to Nicodemus, several things jump out at us. One, it tells us at the beginning that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. But we need to understand that that's not an insult. Where today we talk about someone being a Pharisee, it's kind of like a negative term. But at that time, it was not an insult. It was just a matter of the religious group of people that they were part of. How many of you have heard of Sadducees? I mean, have you heard of Pharisees? As I just said, many of us have heard of these titles. But we understand that whenever we talk about Nicodemus and we call him a Pharisee, do we understand what exactly does he believe in? Notice Jesus goes and has a conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Well, I think it's important that we understand what the title Sadducee and Pharisee actually are. Let me give you, if you're taking notes, what it is means to be a Sadducee. A Sadducee was someone who was conservative in their doctrine. A Sadducee was someone who insisted that when they read the Torah, it was the literal meaning. It was not some kind of puffed up meaning or something they read into it. A Sadducee, they rejected the idea of a resurrection. When they heard Jesus talk about that he was the resurrection, they would laugh at that because they didn't believe in a resurrection. A Sadducee believed that when a soul died in death that they perished. There was no afterlife. A Sadducee was part of the elitist group, the aristocrats, the, the people that were wealthy. All your chief priests, all your high priests were Sadducees. The Sadducees had a majority seats in the Sanhedrin. You remember it was the Sanhedrin that Jesus stood in front of that were made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. The Sadducees were more than friendly to Rome because they loved to play the part of the politician. The Sadducees actually ceased to exist after Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. So if their whole focus is there at the temple in 70 AD when it's destroyed, you can imagine that it comes to an end. So that's the Sadducees on one side of the table. Then on the other side of the table, you have the Pharisees that Nicodemus is. Pharisees were ones who actually gave equal authority to oral tradition as they did the written word, meaning that stories that were told. The Pharisees, like Nicodemus, they believed that there was an afterlife. They believed when you died, you were going to go somewhere. 
The Pharisees also believed in angels and demons. The Pharisees were part of the working class. They had calluses on their hands. They knew what it meant. They didn't come for money. They were normally respected by the average person. The Pharisees were the ones who controlled the synagogues. And the Pharisees, they had more encounters. If you read the Gospels, you find out that it was the Pharisees who actually encountered Jesus more than the Sadducees. The Pharisees are part of what we know today as a, of a modern Judaism was birthed from the Pharisaic movement. And so that's where we have Nicodemus. We have Nicodemus being part of a working class, believing in demons, believing in the afterlife. All of these things about Nicodemus that maybe is not normally brought out. Nicodemus comes to him, Jesus, and he says that we know that you're a good teacher. We know these things that you must be coming from God. And I love what Jesus does. Jesus actually just gets to the point. How many of you know sometimes we beat around the bush about we wonder if someone's saved. We need to just come right out and say, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? There are sermons that are preached that pastors, they will go all around the topic and never say, are you saved? Are you redeemed? Are you forgiven of what you have done? They'll talk about everything else and they'll just maybe hint at what salvation is. Let me say to you today that we're either saved or we're lost. You see, when we see this scripture, we need to see this. One, if you're taking notes, one, we notice this, is that it is Jesus who says that a new spirit will be put in us. You see, when we read John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it is almost verbatim of what we read in Ezekiel, for it said in chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, he says, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God because you have some kind of secret knowledge. You can't enter the kingdom of God because you attend a church. You cannot enter the kingdom of God because you and the offering. You cannot enter the kingdom of God simply because you said you were a Baptist or your name's written on a church roster somewhere. The only way we can enter the kingdom of God is that we must be saved. We must ask Christ to be the ruler of our life and to live it and believe it. It says a new spirit he puts in us and it continues it says that unless we do this, we will not enter the kingdom of God. Whatever's born of flesh is flesh. When you see the world act like sinners, don't be surprised because a sinner will act as the flesh that they are. But so many times we get as if when we turn on the television, we're surprised of what we see on TV. I will let you know when you turn on the television, they want to feed your flesh. What's happening in the streets of America today is because we have fed the flesh and not fed the spirit. You see, the spirit is hungry and we know this because there's so many young people that they get into college and they go off to school and, or they grow and up and they leave their families and, and they seek something spiritual. Meaning that they want something like the, to uh, have like this transcendental uh, being focused in on something or, or have a spirit of a Buddhist. I say this because I even have one of my own family members who was raised up in the church and then when he got old enough and left home and while even really at home, he leaves his family and goes and joins a Buddhist group, shaves his head, has the long ponytail at the time on the back of his head. They, they took him in, they fed him, they clothed him, they taught him the ways of the Buddha, and now he's even got his own family uh, believing some of their teachings, saying, well, I can see where it is compatible. I will let you know this. There is nothing compatible that is not Jesus Christ. It is Christ plus nothing. And if you think just because your child does it, it makes it right, my friends, you are totally wrong. It's sad today, though, that many believers, if their child gets involved in some new age movement, if their child gets involved in something that is totally against the teachings of Christ, instead of wanting to hurt their child's feelings or maybe even endanger their relationship with their child, that they'll go along with it and even endorse it. 
I've seen it even with children that come out of the closet and say, Mom and Dad, I know you raised me as a believer in Christ, but I'm no longer going to follow the teachings that you have because I have matured in my own thinking and they go and enter into a same-sex relationship. And the person that was conservative and believed the Bible, then what they begin to do is they start endorsing it and start twisting the Scripture saying, Well, we know God's a loving God because they don't want to lose a relationship with their child. My friends, I'm more concerned about my child losing a relationship with God the Father than I am about my child losing a relationship with me. Because they can lose and ha- Your kids can have a falling out with you. They can. But the Spirit of God can convict them. The Spirit of God can touch them. The Spirit of God can move upon them. And you don't move and waver on what you know is true. And then we can see they come back to the truth. They come back to the teaching that you gave them early in life. And they're appreciative that you didn't waver. But if you're wavering like the ocean sea with them, then my friends, the only thing you've done is hand your child over to the enemy. We do that so often when we send our children off to college and they are one way at home and then they go off to school and they're taught something and they just soak it up like a sponge. I'll say this to you, if you have children that are going off to school, make sure they know Jesus Christ. And that's even if they're going to a religious school. Because you can go to a religious school and still not hear about the true Jesus. So what do we see? A new spirit is put in us. Number two, dead people can't see. We wonder why our churches are not packed. The reason why is because dead people don't see a need to be in the fellowship of other believers. Right now, I saw something recently where a minister, and I use that term very, very loosely, a minister's spouse put on Facebook the idea that you need to stay home, that you don't need to go to church, and that the only reason why you're going to church is so that you can be seen and and have self-pride in you going. I thought, how foolish of a statement. Why would someone even make a statement like that? And and they went on with other things that they were saying about how when you go into church, you're only thinking about yourself. You need to be thinking about others and stay home. In fact, in what they posted, they put this, you need to stay the H-E-L-L home. I thought to myself, you know what? Something's wrong with a person like that. But you see, what happens is that we get so entangled in the world that when even when a minister or their spouse talks like that, we say, well, we can understand. My friends, we get our dictates not from the government. We get our dictates and orders from God's Word. The dead cannot see, so they do not understand that they're dead. A dead person doesn't know they're dead. You might say, well, well, duh. But what I mean by that is spiritually, they have no clue that what they're doing is wrong. You see, when we're born, we are born alive in the flesh, but dead in the spirit. That is why Jesus says that we must be born again. Jesus actually is someone who divides people in groups. You might say, oh no, not my Jesus. My Jesus welcomes everybody. Well, it's not the same Jesus I know because Jesus makes it clear. You're either saved, you're alive, you're born again, or you're lost, and you are not going to heaven. You see, it looks foolish to a dead person, maybe even mythical or boring to talk about church, to talk about reading your Bible. Folks, today, if you are alive in Christ, we should be doing what alive people do. There is a difference in what a live person does and what a dead person does. A dead person lays there and does nothing. Spiritually, we got dead people that lay there and do nothing. When Jesus says that you are part of his kingdom and you're shining out the light of the kingdom, and that's what we do, we're alive and active. A dead person is decaying, the flesh is falling off, it stinks. We know that the Bible says that we're saved is like a sweet aroma. You see, my friends, there is a difference in being alive and being dead. 
If you don't believe that, I'll take you to any cemetery and dig up any body and I'll say, now you tell me, is there a difference in this body and your body? But why is it if we know the difference in the physical, do we not understand the difference in the spiritual? There are pastors. They can get up and preach a good sermon, but spiritually they are dead and dying and decaying. They preach a dead message, a decaying message. They don't believe in what they're preaching. And my friends, someone like that should be stricken down by God Himself because what they're doing is they're causing more spiritual cancer in the body of Christ and they're destroying many people. So what do we see? Dead can't see. Nicodemus couldn't see. Nicodemus was religious, but he could not see the need of salvation. He doesn't even go to Jesus about salvation. But you notice in the text, Jesus starts talking about salvation. Why? Because Jesus knew, I could be friends with Nicodemus, but if I don't get to the root matter, Nicodemus will go to hell. You see, you can be friends. Do you have friends that are not saved? I do. You should too. But if you do have friends that are not saved and you don't talk about Jesus to them and the importance of salvation, then you're really not a good friend. And you might say, well, Pastor, I try not to have friends like that. Well, how do you expect your testimony to get to those that need it? What we do, we see Christ and what we say. Number three. Jesus says the wind blows where it wills. What is the wind? The wind is the image of the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, we believe in the doctrine that when you're saved, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. There are denominations, there's groups that do not believe that, do not teach that. They believe that you get saved and maybe later on you go through a process of sanctification, that you are living as a good boy, a good girl, and and, and, and you're following the Scriptures You don't drink, you don't cuss, you don't go out with those that do. I mean, all of those things that we're raised, you know, thinking that if we're we're saved, we're going to be good people. I'm going to tell you something. You can have the best attitude, you can do the best deeds, but that's not salvation. Here what we see is that when the Holy Spirit enters into you, it changes who we are. If you've not seen a change in your life from the time you were saved and not saved, I would question my salvation. You might say, well, the pastor led me through a prayer. I can lead you through anything. Talk and I can get you to recite something. But it does not mean because you recited it that your life has been totally transformed by a living Savior. I can have you recite anything. But it doesn't mean just because you say it, that's what it is. I've heard people say this. They make statements and they'll say, I'm this and I'm that. And it's like what they're saying doesn't match up for what, who they are. Have we done that before? Yes. We're all guilty at some point of that. The point is this, is that it is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit itself that comes in. And we kind of like get on Nicodemus and say, Nicodemus, oh, he's so dense. You know, we're looking at this 2,000 years behind us and we've got so much knowledge. But we need to understand that when Nicodemus is hearing this, he is baffled. You see why? Because we are baffled by the idea that someone would die for us and be risen again. You see, in John 3, 8, it lets us know that we need to have a new spiritual life. And Jesus demands that we do this and that we are birthed by the Holy Spirit. The church in the book of Acts was birthed by the Holy Spirit. You as a believer in Christ should be birthed by the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God not to be afraid of, but it's the Spirit of God to embrace. Having the Holy Ghost does not mean that you're jumping pews and speaking in tongues. Having the Holy Ghost means that you are simply controlled by God. We have prostituted the Holy Ghost. What the Holy Ghost can do for us, saying that I have the Holy Ghost, so I'll cast out demons, or I can do this and I can do that. My friends, it's not about what we can do when we have the Holy Ghost. It's about what God can do Himself. He can do all things. 
I've had those that I love tell me that I don't, they don't have the Holy Ghost because they never spoke in tongues. And I said, well, have you called on the name of Jesus? Are you saved? Have you asked Him to forgive you your sins? Yes, I do. I said, well, then why would you not believe that He would send a comforter, the, another comforter, the Greek word there was the paraclete. He would send that to guide you and convict you of what you're doing. If you're saved and you do wrong, does it bother you? If it does bother you, it's because the Holy Spirit is there saying, this is not right. It does not mean when you're saved that you'll never do anything that wrong again, that you'll be perfect. I was raised thinking that, that once I'm saved, oh, I'm supposed to be perfect. And you know what? That's the worst feeling to have because you will never, ever reach that. You'll go to bed every night praying, dear God, Please, if there was something I did wrong, please don't send me to hell. Not realizing that's not what salvation is. You are saved and redeemed. It is Satan that wants to play games with you and make you think that you will go to hell simply because you did not live up to the promise that you made. David Jeremiah, one of the great preachers of our time, said the following, Saving us is the most and greatest demonstration of God's love and it displays of God's grace throughout time and eternity. What is the greatest demonstration? It is what God has done for us. Now, if you got your pen and pad, paper, are you ready to mark your Bible? I've got some scriptures here. We're going to hit it hard and fast. We're going to go at it and go with it strong. So, I ask you this, for you that are here today, And those of you listening at home, we have people listening on the radio, we have people listening on Facebook, we have people over in the fellowship hall. So if you're listening to this, I will ask this question. Do you know someone who is not saved? Do you know someone who is not saved? And here's the thing, if you do and you leave here today, I will give you tools that you can use to lead them to the Lord. Here we go. Are you ready? I guess the question should be this. If you know someone that's not saved, do you want them saved? All right. John chapter 1 verse 9. Are you ready? If you got your writing it, write it. If you don't have a pen... You can't keep up, see me later, and I will give you a copy of all of my notes. John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful, who is the He? It's Christ Jesus. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John 1, 9 says, if we will do what? Confess our sins. Confess them to who? Jesus. Is it because Jesus is going to be surprised? No. It's the act of going to Him knowing that I turn over my life to Him and He already knows what it's like. And why do we do this? Because He is faithful and righteous to forgive. He forgives us of all our sins. So first and foremost, you talk to someone about salvation, they say, you just don't know the mess that I've done. You don't know all the people that I've laid in the bed with. You don't know all the drugs I've put in my system. You don't know all the hangovers I had because of alcohol. You don't know all the times I've lied and cheated and gossiped. And you can say to them, you're right, I don't know. But God knows and God's willing to forgive you. I thank God for that. So whatever it is that person says to you, you can say to them, does that fall in the category of being forgiven in verse 9 of chapter 1 of John of all our sins? The answer is yes. Verse John chapter 5 verse 13. I have written these things to you that you may believe in His name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Folks, that's the one thing that Satan wants to do. He wants you to believe that you might be saved or you might not be saved. You need to stand on the principles of God and say, I know that I know that I know I'm saved. There's days you're going to wake up and you don't feel saved. But you are saved because salvation is not about an emotional feeling. Salvation is not about crying and boo-hoo and and falling out in the spirit. Salvation is knowing God and God knowing you. 
Now, will you cry at times? Yes. Will you might fall out in the Spirit? Absolutely. Can you do all of them things? Absolutely. But what I'm telling you today is that emotions will get you in trouble. How many of you know emotions get us in trouble sometimes? Amen? Woo! 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord wants all to come to repentance. Let me say this to you that are watching and you that are listening that might be following in the camp of the Calvinists that believe that only some have been predestined to be saved and some are not predestined to be saved. What don't you get about 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord wants everyone, all of us to come to repentance. But just because the Lord wants it doesn't mean it's going to happen. I want my children, all three of them, to be saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb, but it does not mean it's going to happen. Don't you want the same out of your family? Romans chapter 10, 13. Are you still with me? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you tell that person, you call on the name of the Lord, everyone, don't be afraid to take your Bible and say to them, take your pencil out and say to your friend who might be his name is John or Bobby or Billy or Sarah or Mary, whatever their name is, and you write their name right there in pencil above that text and say to them, Mary, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Bobby, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Adam, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. James, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And show them, this means you. That's the kiss gospel message. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Once you're saved, you are saved. It's not a little bit of salvation. It's not that he saved one leg out of the water and left the other leg in the water. You're saved. You've been redeemed. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not rule over you because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. I was raised under the law, and I will tell you it's the most burdenous thing to happen. Where you can't wear shorts above your knee. You couldn't go to the theater. You could not wear certain clothes. If you're a woman, you couldn't have worn makeup or jewelry. I was raised under those kind of law, legalistic things. And then I asked the question when I got older, well, where is this in the Bible? And the answer is, well, this is what we teach. There's churches that teach stuff like that. does not necessarily mean because you teach it, it's right. I will let you know today is that God Almighty... Is not going to judge you based on the law, but he looks at you through the eyes of grace. I thank God for that because I am not worthy. I am not worthy, and and let's just be honest, neither are you. You're not worthy to step on the you're not worthy to step on the streets of gold. You're not worthy to look upon Jesus face to face. You're not worthy to see his nail scarred hands. But because of grace. Because of his mercy, you will be able to do so. Psalm 37, verse 39. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Their refuge is in him in a time of distress. So in Psalm 37, 9, it says our salvation is from who? Not the Southern Baptist Convention. Our salvation is from Jesus. That's where it comes from. Psalm 25, verse 5. Guide me in your truth. Teach me because you are the Lord my God. You are my salvation. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not by works of righteousness, meaning that you you doing the right thing at the right time. He didn't save you by that measure. Titus, it says this in 3, 5. He saved us not by our works of righteousness. Well, what we had done. Folks, when I die, do not talk about all the things that I've done that's got me into heaven. When I die, you can say this. Ken was a sorry sinner at one point. He was going to hell at one point. But he came to understand that Jesus Christ was the only way. And he repented of those sins. And he's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And now he's there with the saints. Because of Jesus, not because of Ken. If you ever come to my graveside and say that I'm in heaven because of anything I did, 
God help you because it's not. I deserve to go to a sinner's hell. But because of Jesus and because he's my Savior and because I have confessed him and I believe in my heart, I know my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. 2 Timothy 1.9, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling. My friends, I don't care what denomination you are, you are to be holy. You are to be holy. There's something special about a holy calling. It says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Oh, isn't this amazing how it keeps repeating this? We're not saved by an organization we're members of. We're not saved because we are able to read Hebrew. We're not saved because of anything like that. We're saved because of grace. It says, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before even the beginning of time, God said, these people are going to need my son. Oh, I'm so glad he made a way out. And then Psalm 3.8. Are you bored with the scripture? I hope not. Psalm 3.8 says, Salvation belongs to who? The Lord. Salvation does not belong to a Catholic priest. To say if you say a Hail Mary or if you give a certain amount of money back in the, the days of uh, that Roman Catholicism was running wild, that if you gave a certain amount of money that you could actually get your loved one out of purgatory, which does not exist, but get them out of purgatory and get them to heaven. If you gave a certain amount of money, the priest would pray them out of there. But once someone takes their last breath, you might as well quit praying for them. They're either in heaven or they're in hell. That's as plain as it can get. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, oh, you know this. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That's what salvation is. It's getting to God, but you've got to go through a certain door. People will say to you, well, as long as I get to God, it does not matter what door I go through. And I think about growing up, and you remember the game show back in the 70s and 80s, uh, Let's Make a Deal. Do you remember that show? Back in, some of you are old enough to remember that. And so in that game show, you would sometimes, it would have what's behind door number one. What, do you remember, am I right on this? And you would pick a door. And sometimes you pick a door and guess what? Oh, it was the greatest prize there is. And then other doors you open up and it'd be something like, rah, rah, rah. I mean, it was like, it was a sorry prize. You know, oh, you're the winner of a bicycle with two flat tires. Yay. And a rusty chain. You see, if we think we could get to God through any measure, it is as if we're trying to open the door and say, let's make a deal. My friends, Jesus is the deal. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he does not say you've got to guess on which way to get there. He will say, pick door number one. That's the way. Are you sure? Because, you know, door number two really looks special. Door number three really is calling my name. Jesus says there's only one door. There's only one way to get to God. It's through Jesus. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Two more texts and I'll be done. Acts 2 38 says repent. Don't we need to say that more often? Repent. Don't we need to do that more often? Repent. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now let me just say to you, this is why I have such an issue with the difference of infant baptism and infant dedication. If you have a baby, you should dedicate that baby to Christ. But if you have a baby, we're not baptizing babies. And let me explain why. Because biblically it says that we are to repent and then be baptized. I've got a baby at the house. I've got a 16-week-old. And I will tell you this, is that no, we've not had an opportunity to bring him into the service and do a dedication, but we have already dedicated him. 
We're going to go through the motions here in church, but we've already said, God, this is your child. Guide him, lead him, protect him. Use us in doing so. Anoint him. But understand that I'm not going to baptize Lincoln until Lincoln confesses with his mouth who Jesus is, confesses his sins, he repents of what he has done, he's born into sin, and, and I will say this to you, until my son does that, I would be wrong spiritually if I baptized him, and then when he gets to be a teenager or an adult, he does not have a recon- he cannot realize and remember, well, I got baptized, mom and dad told me as a baby, so I must be saved. That's not salvation. And I'm not saying this to to be controversial. I'm saying this to be biblical. You see, because what happens when we get wrapped up in tradition that we forget about the Bible. I was raised up in tradition. Many of you were raised up in tradition, even in Baptist churches. Traditions that were not and are not biblical. Mark 16, 16, last verse, maybe. Maybe. I just see if you're paying attention. Whoever believes and is baptized, what do you got to do first? You got to believe. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but who does not believe is condemned. Mark 16, 16. Do you love the Word of God? I hope so. Acts 3, you want one more? Okay. Acts 3, 19. I heard somebody say one more. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins will be wiped out, that the season of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You repent and come back to the Lord. Come on back to Him. He knows what you've done already. One more. Somebody said one more. Okay. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people that we must be saved. If I was an attorney and pleading a case, I have presented to you the facts. If I was standing here today and you were the jury and you had to make a decision, and that's what every sermon really is all about, is that you are the jury, you have to decide. But you know what? Guess who's on trial? Not me. You're on trial for yourself. You have to decide when you listen to the sermon... Am I guilty of anything that has been read? Am I genuinely saved based on the scriptures that the pastor has shared? Not on what the pastor thinks, but what the Bible says. And if you can genuinely say, I know that I know that I'm saved based on the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, our instructions for living in this life, if you can say that, my friends, then you can die happy knowing this. I'm saved not based on all the good things I've done, but I'm saved based on all what God has done through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, if you are not saved, I beg you to please consider that. Most of you, I probably imagine everyone in here is saved. But I don't know that. I mean, I grew up fooling people that I was saved. I grew up in church. Granddad was the pastor. They thought I was saved just because of that association. My friends, that wasn't the case. When I came under conviction, tears ran down my face. I can remember when I went to the altar because I was under conviction thinking, oh, I've done everything, but I was nothing more than the Sadducee and a Pharisee. And that wasn't going to be enough. So today I encourage you to please consider what I've read for the Scripture the account of Ezekiel, the account of Jesus and Nicodemus, and ask yourself if you're saved. If you are saved, are you doing what Christ has called you to do? Are you more concerned about the things of this world, or are you concerned about eternal things? Let's pray.